Meeple Nation Podcast, episode 382, Roll Them Four Games. Welcome, citizens of Meeple Nation. For the next 30 minutes, sit back and enjoy. Meeple Nation Podcast is brought to you by GameToppersLLC.com. If you're looking for a way to make your table go from eh to ah, Game Toppers is where it's at. Check out their website. They just finished a new Kickstarter. They have so many cool things. If you're looking at building a game table, it's actually cheaper to go to Game Toppers, and they have such a good variety of artwork for the mats just to improve your existing table. There's so many cool things to do. Check them out. GameToppersLLC.com Totally thought you were going to say they could improve your existence, which is also (laughs) true. (laughs) Existence. uh, uh. I mean, my life has been greatly improved from the Game Toppers. I don't know if everybody else has. If they have a Game Topper, I'm sure it has. It's true. Welcome to Meeple Nation. We are your hosts. I'm Andy Holiday. I'm Nathan Howard. I'm Dave Holiday, And I'm Logan Howard. We have a website, a new website. It's fairly new. It's been out for a few months. Jump on there. We have blogs to check out. We have a weekly blog. BGGCon is in November, and we are planning on being there. Great times. I'm super excited for BGGCon this year. I'm so excited that they're actually going to have BGGCon in Texas this year. This is going to be everybody's first time, right? Yeah, it'll be my first time at BGGCon. Everyone, it's not your first time. No, not my first time. It'll be my third time there. I'm excited. I've had a lot of fun there in the past. Because we were planning on going last year. That's right, you and me were, yeah. whole world went to hell in the handbasket last year. That's where that handbasket was headed. Excited this year to go to BGGCon. Good times now that COVID's decided to calm down a little bit as it perks back up. This week we are talking about four different dice games. Use dice as a large part of the mechanics. We are each discussing one game individually. I'm going to start off with my game. My game is Medici the Dice Game. So Medici the Dice Game is a new take off of Medici. Medici came out in 1995. So back when our group was in its infancy, this was a game that we played... Back when I was in my infancy? Probably. But this is a game that we played a lot. The cards that I have are very worn out. The game has had a lot of love. Definitely early on, one of my all-time favorite games. Yeah, I remember this was one that you were always keen to pull out. And it was great because it was six players. It was easy to get everybody involved. I really enjoyed the game. Medici the Dice Game, it's a shorter version, and we played it did we play it twice here together? I think so. I played it once on my own. So it's a one to four player game, plays in about 20 minutes, And I think that was pretty close to what our play was. And playing the solo version, it was a little bit faster for me. The game is played over three rounds of shipping, three days. The active player is going to roll five dice, and then the active player gets the opportunity to take anywhere from one to three of those dice. They will select that, and the dice will have a face value on it, but there are resources on there. Spices, dye, grain, fur and linen. Depending on what you roll in the die, you'll get the face value, and you'll write that in your top column. Depending on what resource that is, you will put an X or a hash mark, whatever you're going to use, in your resource column. Below the face value, you'll write that face value again, and so then the next resource you take will be to the right of that, and then you will sum the two so that your bottom row for each day will just give you a running total of what your boat value is. At the end of the round, depending on how many players, one, two, or three people will get a bonus for having the largest boat, then the second largest boat, and the third largest boat. By largest, I mean the value, the total value of everything that you've shipped that turn. You also get a bonus on who shipped the most of each good. If you had the most spice or you had the most linen, then you're going to score a bonus off of that And then again, depending on the number of people, the next person will score a lower bonus. Then you will combine your boat total with your bonus total, and that will give you the grand total that you have for that day of shipping. And then the next day, the boat's a little bit bigger, and then the third and final day, the boat is bigger still. 
as the active player, I'm going to take one to three of those dice. That leaves the remaining pool open for all the other players to select a die from. They can select the same die if they want, or they can select a different die. Again, they're going to add the face value to their top row, add that total to their secondary row. Again, they're going to add that resource to those columns. I really enjoy the game. I really enjoy, like I said, Medici. I think this is a great, simple version of the regular game. After you sum up all your totals for the three days, whoever has the most points wins. And really quick, 20 minutes. I think it's a good game, too. Part of it, I think, is it reminds me of Medici. I just had a lot of fond memories playing Medici. Very simple. It was very quick. I liked the dice and how they worked. You could choose whatever dice you wanted. Those were now unavailable to everybody else. But the remaining dice were available to everybody else to choose one of them. I liked how that worked out. And there's a lot of strategy in that. There were several times where being the active die roller, depending on what you were trying to do, you may only want to choose one of the dice. Then you're leaving four dice that are going to help everybody else, possibly. So there was just a lot of different variables that you had to take into account. One of the things that I wonder... So in the game that we played, I had the biggest boat, I think, all three days. Yes. And I ended up winning the game not by much. Logan was a close second. He was also generally the second biggest boat. I wonder if it's the person with the biggest boat is just generally going to win. I kind of doubt it, but I think that's mostly a hopeful doubt. Not necessarily... Uh... It was a really close game from what we played, and I think what lost it for me was I wasn't paying too close attention to keeping either the majority or tying with the different good. If you were tied or had the most, or if you didn't come in last, you got bonus points at the end of each round, depending right. on where you were. I think it was Spices, the purple one, that everybody had a ton of them. So I didn't care to put any points into that, but I was trying to either have the most or second at least of all the other ones i think i lost track of a couple my approach to that i just picked two goods based on early roll picked two goods that i hoped that i would be able to maintain the lead in or if not the lead second place at the very worst i was able to keep that with two of them in your other plays nathan have you seen that work out that way has it ever been one person has just walked away with the big boat every time well, yeah, it was always me. It was playing solo. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I did like about the dice, if you roll a zero, you can choose to take that zero. It doesn't make your boat bigger, which I focus more on trying to get goods, which I lost horribly because of this, which kind of goes to your point, Dave. But I tried to focus more on goods. If you take a zero, you get double the goods, whereas you're not increasing the boat size. I kind of like that aspect of it, but I think it ended up hurting me in the end because of the fact that my boat values were very lacking. I actually think I enjoy the original game Medici more. That being said, I love the size of this game. It's small enough to pull this out and play it at a restaurant while you're waiting for your food. And it's fast enough that you would be finished by the time your food came. I love games like that. For me and my wife, we've been married long enough that sometimes there's just don't even know what to talk about. So playing a game when we're out eating is actually kind of nice. You know, it's something to do. Because we talk all the time. You're out eating. There's nothing really to talk about. Great game, though. I, I really enjoyed it, even though I kind of got smoked on it. Yeah, I lost my first competitive game, but my solo games I did pretty good. Nice. That's Medici the Dice Game. What we were talking about last week, the, the different type of dice games that they have, this is one that I think they've done really well with. Here's a great classic game. Let's reimagine it into a dice game. I don't remember playing the original Medici, but this was fun. You like the original better? That's great. It was nice because Andy got a chance to play the original one two weeks before with Sabrina, his wife. Two weeks after that, we played the dice version. Andy had both of them fresh on his mind. Great opportunity to compare. Yeah, for sure. So my game is one that I was not fully committed mentally to play. It was Monopoly with the actual rules. No house rules. That is like one of the biggest things with the cultural impact on Monopoly is that People don't learn how to play the game from the rules. They learn to play the game from other people. And then you have somebody nice like mom or the aunt, the older sister, the babysitter that wants to play with the younger children, but they don't want to play as cutthroat as the game is supposed to be played. Oh, don't worry. I won't charge your rent this time. You get a freebie from me. The game just ends up lasting so much longer. I guess there's some anger issues that come out. Oh, no, it's our game that we played. There was a little bit of anger towards the end. Towards the yeah. middle, when I made a major mistake, made a deal with Dave, that was... Uh, it wasn't uh, a mistake. 
It was most definitely a mistake. <laughs> but I was actually really surprised. I didn't hate playing Monopoly as much as I thought I was going to. Definitely not a game that I'm going to like suggest every week or even every year. But if we play it, I'll be like, eh, okay. Because playing with the actual rules made it so much better. There just wasn't the constant influx of cash as there can be when you play with some of those house rules. We did play a full game, just over two and a half hours. The rule book does have some speed up the game rules. One of the suggestions was you randomly deal out three properties to each player. So that helps speed up the game. But even the first part where we were going around just buying properties, I felt that part went really quite fast. Yeah, we definitely were speed playing. The game. Yeah. It was roll, move. Nathan, as banker, never seen him move so fast in his life. Constantly moving, shifting money in and out, and probably taking some by himself. <laughs> <laughs> if I did that, I should have taken a whole lot more because I needed more. Yeah, math was not his friend when we were playing this game. <laughs> It was a decent game. We went fairly quick with that part. It's all about luck when you're playing the first couple of rounds because it's wherever you land, as long as you have money, buy it. That's the strategy for the first couple of rounds. After pretty much most of the properties go, then it's, okay, who has what? How can I wear them down to get them to accept a good trade for me? And that's what Dave did. That is exactly what Dave did. Because I had Boardwalk. He had the Park Place property. He kept trying to wheel and deal to get... Either that from me, or give it to me, and to make the trade fair, he had to take two or three properties away from me. Mathematic: if you own both Park Place and Boardwalk, anybody lands there, you're paying big bucks. The problem is that's only two locations, and the chance of somebody landing on those two locations is less. But if they do, then the payment is huge. Especially when he traded enough properties where he had the entire side of the board, pretty much. Dave ended up with having Monopoly on the cheapest buildings. And then he was able to put houses on there cheap, cheaper than the rest of the properties. Hotels on there. And then that quickly became death row for anybody that went on there. And I think that was what took me out first. I was the first one to be eliminated. You went through the, the gauntlet. His, gauntlet. Andy's was at the end of that, right around the corner from my stuff. I whittled you down, took most of your cash, and then you landed on Andy, and you had to give him all of your properties and the remaining cash. Then Logan was eliminated on your gauntlet, and then it was a battle royale between the holidays. Royale, more like wearing down at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it really was. <laughs> Dave we were all ready to be done. Yeah, but Dave definitely had the advantage going into that. Paid off. It's all based off of luck, too. David had all of his properties all upgraded like he did. Nobody ever landed on it. It wouldn't mean anything. And that's what it is. The game is all luck. There's not a lot of strategy. There's I'd... hoping. There's praying. Send me to jail. That was kind of funny that we kept <laughs> wishing to go to jail. If you're in jail, you don't risk landing on somebody, but you still can collect rent. It was kind of safe to be in jail. It was kind of funny for us to go, oh, man, I hope I get to jail. I hope I get to jail. I hope I get that third double in a row so it sends me to jail. I land on go to directly to jail. You talk about it being solely luck. I disagree. There is definitely a luck element in it. But it's all about hedging your bet. Trying to say, okay, Dave, he was trying to get Boardwalk Park Place. From there, he was trying to get, I don't know what you call the others, the light blue and the purple ones. Just trying to get that Monopoly, even those smaller ones. And that's really what ended up winning it for Dave. He was able to monopolize on those smaller ones. That was a strategic move, trying to say, okay, can I sacrifice this, hedge my bets over here? Am I going to risk losing this, even though at first it might not be huge? I had the green section, and I had two houses on each of those. Uh, Logan, you stopped there once, had to pay me $400. Then when you go through Dave's, and when it had two houses, it was only like $90. But Dave was able to buy more houses, and quickly that $90 became $550. Boom, boom. And that was ultimately where I was trying to go with it. You know, if I can own this side of the board, that's the cheap side of the board. It's not as high a rent or anything, but I can get all the houses and everything on it real quick. The only way it was going to work, goes to your point with strategy, is the only way that was going to work was if I could get it early enough before you guys had enough money to pour the same idea into yours. I had enough cash, knew that I could get in there and pump it up real quick. Again, it goes back to luck. How did you have all that cash? By the luck of landing on certain spots, getting money from other people, you can strategize about what you're dealt, but getting what you're dealt, that's just what it is. Right. Like going around the board, 
Nathan ran out of money. So then we actually had to take a couple properties to auction, which is great for me because I was just trying to drive up the price to take money away from you and Andy. I didn't really care if I spent 400 or $500 on this property because they're willing to keep going up and I'll let them take it at 480 $200 over what it was worth. Right. It just takes money away from you. There's certain things that you can deal with after you're dealt it. You have to play the situation that you're in. What really won it for Dave was Nathan wearing down and saying, well, we're going to have to do some trades eventually. And then Andy jumping on it, going like, okay, trade me this and this. Because Andy and I made a trade. So I gave Andy a monopoly. It gave me a monopoly. So we could start building houses. My mistake was not saving enough money to be able to survive going around the board before I made that trade with Dave. I honestly think if you hadn't made that trade, you would have won. Because you had the better monopoly between the two of us. Nobody else had any monopolies besides you and I. I think you would have won if you had not made that trade. The game would have lasted longer. It would have. That's really what it came down to. It was just a stall. We're not kids. We could all look at it. Dave wanted to trade some of my stuff. Why do you want my yellow? I only have one yellow. You don't have any. Oh, because you want a better trade position with Nathan. No, I don't want you to have the (laughs) novel. Eventually, the game has to end. So eventually, some sort of trade has to be made. Lesser two evils. And I hope the luck works in my favor. Nathan, yes, if he would have stopped at that Monopoly, he had the better Monopoly. But it only depends is if somebody lands on it when right. they come around. Well, that was Dave's favorite spot, is what I traded away. So Dave would have landed. Ultimately, that's the end of the game, right? It's when somebody makes a bad decision. And then it quickly spirals down. Well, I don't know if bad decision is really the correct term for it. Because it's just makes a decision and then if Lux favors him or not. There's definitely an element of luck in there. Because I, don't think I was it's able. Luck. The only reason why I outlasted you was because I was lucky landing on my own four properties that I owned. Agreed. The other free spot around the board to be able to outlast you is basically what it came down to. Agreed. That's Monopoly. Wasn't as bad as I remembered and I feared it was. We played the I Love Lucy edition. I do not love the print, it was very hard <laughs> to read. But who would have thought? that we'd be able to sit here and talk about Monopoly. Let alone (laughs) I Love Lucy Monopoly. Let alone Better Than Terraforming Mars Monopoly. Oh, please. (laughs) It is kind of funny, because last week it was just Dave and I on game night. So we did play Terraforming Mars, because I know Logan and Andy is not your favorite game, and that game did last twice as long as this game of Monopoly did. I always remember this when we would say, hey, Nathan, let's play Eldritch Horror. No, no, that game lasts way too long. And then he'll play Terraforming Mars for five hours. And that was a two-player game. But Terraforming Mars is fun while you're playing it. (laughs) There's so much downtime. Eldritch Horror is not as bad as Arkham Horror. Arkham Horror is the one that I'm like, no, I'm not going to play it. When it's 20 minutes between turns, the phone comes out. Then somebody says, oh, it's your turn. And I'm like, so uninvested in the game at that point. And it's like, tell me what I'm doing. Great. Let me get back to my video on my phone. <laughs> so I have chosen to talk about Taverns of Tiefenthal. Taverns of Tiefenthal is about village of Tiefenthal, and in the village lies a tavern. There all citizens from the area gather, but it's important to attract new and wealthy guests, for only then is there enough money to expand your tavern, which will then lure nobles into the tavern as well. But which tavern expansion is best? Should you focus on money, or rather ensure that the beer will keep flowing? Everybody in this game has their own tavern that you're trying to invest your money, you're trying to brew beer. You start out with three tables, your guests will sit at the table, and this is kind of a deck builder, dice rolling game. Everybody has a starting deck of cards. Early games, the starting cards of this are all the same. The thing I like about this is you can play this in module. I think there are seven different modules that you play in sequential order. And it adds content to the game, which is kind of nice. I I liked it because it's easier to teach newer players the base game, and then you add a little bit of content. And I think it makes the game stay a little fresh for the people that have played it previously. I agree. You have a deck of cards. In that deck of cards, you have a barmaid, a brewer, all your guests that are going to come and sit at your tables, and then you have an extra table. You start out the round by pulling the top card off, and you play in your tavern. Play your barmaid, it has a location next to your tavern to place your barmaids. You're playing your brewer over by your brewer area. Play your table up by your tables. As soon as all your tables are full with guests, then you're done. You don't draw any more cards. 
you're going to finish the round with what you have drawn in front of you. And everybody will do this simultaneously. Everybody draws and has the guests arrive phase and resolves that at the same time. After that happens, everyone's going to roll their dice. And there's a dice drafting element to this. So everyone will have four white dice that they're going to roll. And if they have any barmaids, they'll have colored dice that will match their color that they'll get to roll as well. Those ones are just for them. Right. So they get to keep any colored dice they roll, and you can roll up to three, depending on how many barmaids you have. So one barmaid gives you one die. If you have four barmaids, you still only roll three dice. But you'll roll your all your dice. All the white dice will go on a coaster, which I thought was just such a good touch. I right? like that a lot. Uh, yeah. Starting with the starting player, they're going to draft one of the dice off their coaster. In sequential order, everyone will draft one die off their coaster, and then all the dice get passed clockwise around the table. And this continues until everyone has four white dice. Everybody gets to basically place their dice on their board where they think it's going to go, but the starting player is going to resolve their turn first, resolve their tavern first. Where the dice go will depend on what you want to do and cards you have played. So each of the guests that you play at your table will have a die value on them. Your guests are going to give you money, so they're paying you for the service and for the beer that you're giving them. Your starting guests only have ones and twos pit values for the dice. They give you that much money, one gold or two gold. Your ones and twos are useful at the beginning for getting money. Two other spots that are dice specific, and those are always available on your tavern. You have one spot, which is your brewer spot, and you can place ones and sixes in that, in that location. And that is going to give you one beer, unless you have a brewer or multiple brewers in your brewery. It actually is going to be a multiplier. So let's say I have two sixes and I have a, an extra brewer there. I'm going to multiply two dice times two. So I will get four beers. If I have three brewers, I'm going to get six beers. The more brewers you have, the higher your multiplier is. The other spot that is number specific is your monk location. Five. Track in the center of the board. The monk track. Play a five. And you can play multi-fives on the five spot. And you'll move your token along the monk track. When you pass certain areas on the monk track, it will give you a certain benefit. Sometimes it gives you a card that you get to add to your deck. Sometimes it lets you permanently kick a guest out of your tavern. Which can be really nice. It really can. It lets you cull those low starting cards, mm -hmm. right? And get rid of them so they're not no longer in your in your deck. So you're going to do this. You'll have beer and gold to spend. You can save beer and gold. You have your storage areas that you can upgrade. At the beginning of the game, you can store up to two gold and two beer. One round to the next round. Or you lose it. Now, you're going to spend gold on purchasing cards to put into your deck. You're also going to spend beer on cards. But the cards you get are going to be different. So the cards that are available for gold are barbacks, which cost one gold, dishwashers, which allow you to add a pip to one of your dice. Barbacks just give you a beer, just a free beer for that round. Then there's the barmaid. She will allow you to roll one of your colored dice. There's the table, and then there's the brewer. It's two through six money that will cost you to add those to your deck. Interesting thing about this, as far as a deck builder, is when you gain a card, you don't put it in your discard pile. You actually put it on top of your draw pile. So you can actually set up your next turn at least the top cards, you know what you're going to get. Hopefully, set yourself up for a great next round. Beer is used to purchase guests, new guests that are going to arrive at your tavern. Now, the new guests are going to add different numbers besides just the ones and twos pip values. So those threes and fours that are worthless at the beginning of the game all of a sudden become useful. You're going to gain gold for putting a three pip value on a guest that has a three pip. It's going to give you three money. One other thing you can do with beers is if you get enough beer, which you have to get a lot of beer for this, you can actually gain noble cards up to three by spending. I believe it's nine beers, you can gain one noble card, 14 beers to gain two noble cards, and 18 beers to gain three noble cards. They're guests that has a pit value of two, but they're worth 10 points at the end. By far and away, that's the way to win the game, is to get noble cards. What's nice about the nobles, too, is that when they come out from your deck, all sit together at the same table so it doesn't clog up too much of your space. Exactly. Yeah, they don't sit with the riffraff. They sit with each other. Yeah. Well, as a fellow lord, I understand how they feel. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Definitely one of the benefits. So you're not filling your tables up. You want to be able to get as many cards out as you can before those tables get filled up. You have to make that choice when you're spending your money. Do you buy an extra table? Do you buy the brewer to try to get those nobles or to get better guests? Once you get to this point, you can do upgrades. Upgrades cost gold. They vary broadly on the cost of what it's going to cost to, to do these upgrades. That being said, if you have cards in your tavern, most of the upgrades, you can choose to discard those cards and you gain a discount on that upgrade. So for example, 
To upgrade my tables, it costs 15 gold, which is a lot of gold. That being said, I can discard a table to give myself a 5 gold discount. It's only going to cost me 10. I can discard 3 tables and get the free upgrade. But it's not just a discard. You're removing them from your deck. Right, completely. yes. Yeah, they go back to the supplies. Yes, thank you for that, David. It's not necessarily a discard. It's Those go away from your deck. When you upgrade your tables, you go from 3 permanent tables to 4 permanent tables. I actually love that. It's such a great opportunity mm-hmm. in the game. What strategy you're going for this time? I remember one time we were playing that I was focusing more on producing beer, buying some more of the breweries, and so I was able to get a permanent one. When I got extra ones, it was that much better all the time, instead of if I got lucky that time, I can get two or three out at once. The permanent one is just such a huge upgrade. Brewers, the most expensive upgrade in the game, really, if you can get your brewer upgraded, you can use two different dice bases on the brewer. Being able to put even just one die on the brewer and getting two beers out of it can be huge especially towards the end of the game. Having the dishwashers to change the pips, having the extra spar maids, like, Mm. everything works together. It's really hard to make a really bad choice in this game. Everything works so well together at some point. It's not like, this one kind of sucks. I don't know why I made that choice. This is the base game. It adds more content. You'll gain bards. Your bard is going to move a white cube around and give you bonus points, give you nobles, give you schnapps. You're going to use that schnapps to pay your entertainers and entertainers will be dual-sided. Everybody will gain the entertainers at the same time. For example, you'll have the dancer. She has two sides. One side will allow you to spin schnapps to gain beers, or schnapps to gain gold. Gain her, you have to choose which side she's going to be on, and then that's it. It's permanent for the rest of the game, whatever side you choose. The fire breather, you spend five schnapps, which is a lot, to get a free upgrade. Or you can spend two or three schnapps to permanently cull a guest from your tavern. Very limited ability to get rid of those cards. Very few of those in this game. Sometimes taking that opportunity to cull one of those starting cards and get them out of your deck is super helpful. The last entertainer is the juggler. His abilities, one that allows you to keep a card played in the previous round and put it on top of your draw pile. And then his other ability that allows you to set a die face to a face of your choice. Some of these abilities you can use multiple times, or the times one symbol means you can only use ability once per round, and if it has the dot dot dot, you can do it as much as you can afford. So if you have a ton of schnapps, have at it. You can do as much as you want. It just adds more and more content. You'll have different varying starting deck. Every game progresses and adds a little bit more. I've had fun with this game. It's been great. Yeah, this is a great game. It mixes a couple of my favorite things. The deck builder, got the dice, drafting, incorporates a lot of the mechanics that I really, really love really plays to what you want to do with it. It was funny about this game. I put this game on my 10 for 10, and I don't own this game. And I actually have two on my 10 for 10 that you own, Andy. So that's been kind of interesting to try to get those experiences in while having to rely on opportunities to either be at your house or bring it here on our game night here. Relinquishing control is big for you, boss man. (laughs) (laughs) But I I really enjoy the game. I think the game's a ton of fun. D6s don't typically like me. I like the fact that there is a little bit of dice mitigation in this game. I also like the fact that I can try to get it where it doesn't matter what the role is, I can possibly have a use for it. Maybe it's not perfect. Maybe I get a lot of brewers out and nobody rolls very many ones or sixes. That is terrible, but maybe I can still use those, those threes and fours or whatever. Depends on what I choose to purchase. It's very rarely you're stuck with, well, I can't do anything with this. I guess I'm going to get an extra gold. On top of that, when you roll really poorly, as long as you're playing with enough players, you only have to take one of your dice. Yeah, that's true. And you're going to get the good rolls that I do. Unless everyone rolls poorly, which that has definitely happened. (laughs) I wish it was a rare thing that I didn't have to just get one. There's times that I can't even use one of my dice. I just have to set it to the side, and it's just not going to do me any good because I don't have anything to put it on. So this is Taverns of Tiefenthal. I highly recommend this. I have had a ton of fun with this game. All right, the last game we're going to talk about is Runebound, second edition. Although they have three editions, so play any of them. The one we played in our uh, research session, and it's the one that we've, we've played several times over the last couple of decades, Runebound, second edition. Second edition of Runebound came out... 2005. One of the reasons that I chose this game, this game takes place in the world of Terranoff, and if you know anything about our favorite games, at least me and Andy Poops, Terranoff is the world of Descent. 
fact it's got a lot of the same characters right there just makes it a little better than it otherwise might be. It's a classic adventure game in which mighty heroes must take on the perils of Terranoth. The game can be largely played without conflict between the players, but victory can only be claimed by the first player to defeat the dragon lord Margoth. Players are actually in a race to level up, acquire powerful weapons, armor, and allies in order to take on the final adversary. You set up a board in the middle of the table. It's a map, essentially, of this world. There are cities all over the map. There are hexagonal spaces. There's a lot of different terrain types. There's roads, rivers, hills, mountains, forests, and swamps. Everyone has a mini. Your mini is on the map. On your turn, you're going to roll five dice. They're six-sided dice. They have different symbols on them. Some are symbols of roads, some are symbols of hills, and so on for the different terrain types. You have to allocate a die to move one hex into that terrain type. And if you don't have the terrain where you want to go, tough luck. You don't necessarily get to where you want to go. Spread all across the map are monster spawning spots. Four different levels of monsters. There's green, weakest, yellow, then blue, and then red. As you encounter these monsters, flip over a card. There's a deck for each color, each uh, difficulty level of monsters. And then on that card, it tells you what you're fighting. Sometimes there's an ability that the monster has before battle. What you have to do is you have to overcome that monster. Roll two ten-sided dice. I guess I should back up just a little bit. There's three stages of combat. First, ranged then melee, and then magic. You get to attack during one of those stages of combat. The other two, you just have to try and defend. You have to decide which stage you are going to attempt to attack. And you roll the dice for all three stages. If you get a high enough total between the dice and your skill that you add, you successfully defend or attack. Your character card will tell you how many wounds you're going to cause to the monster. The monster card will tell you how many wounds they cause in each of the other stages of combat. It's great to be able to attack in ranged because if you defeat the monster in the ranged part of combat, you don't have to worry about the other two parts of combat. It can be a little bit of an advantage having a hero that's good at ranged combat. When you defeat monster, you collect a little cardboard tile of the color that indicated the level of the monster. And on the back side of it, it has a number. One on the green, two on the yellow, three and four for the others. And that's essentially the amount of experience that you gain for defeating that monster. Once you have three experience, you can level up. When you do that, you can either gain health or gain stamina. The game that we played early on in the game, Nathan was getting trounced. Was complaining so much. I was dying every turn, it felt like. Right, like almost every turn he would try and fight somebody. He would get defeated himself, which means lose all your gold and your, your most valuable item or ally. So you have to go to the nearest city to start. Nate, it seemed like two or three turns in a row early game, he was dead again. And at the same time, so each of the characters have different abilities. And my character was not bad in combat, but the big thing was he had a discount of one for leveling up. I was able to level up a lot. And so everybody early on was like, oh, Dave's going to destroy us. And poor Nate. It did not take long at all until it was completely flipped and Nate was just running away with it. I got one item, some armor or a shield. shield. It was a shield. Yeah. That I got that just made all the difference in the combat. It was kind of funny, so I was able to fight more and more things and then build an arsenal. It was getting late, and we decided, all right, we're going to pause the game. Everybody was like, I want to see somebody fight at least one red monster. So I got to the point where I was like, okay, I'm going to fight this red monster, which led to Mirnoth. Is that the guy's Margoth. name? Margoth. Margoth. Yeah, some of the red monsters will just automatically tell you to pull Margoth. So we pulled the red monster. Pulled the red monster and actually made really short work of him. It was kind of ridiculous. But so when everybody was like, let's save it. I'm like, oh, one last fight. And then that one last fight ended the game. So, <laughs> and I was triumphant and all my whining paid off. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that kind of sounds like Monopoly. <laughs> I've played a handful of times, but I haven't played since before I moved to Washington until the most recent time we did. The first couple of times, I didn't love it, and I'm not entirely sure why. When I try and think back, I think part of it was I had an item that people wanted, and so people came and attacked me. I don't love that kind of game where you have that conflict. But the last couple of times I've played it, I've actually really liked it a lot. Again, I think part of that might be because I love Descent so much. But we don't really do attacking either. It's rare. One thing we didn't talk about is when you go to town, you get to do a market action. 
and draw market cards. And in the market cards, there are items that you can gain. There are weapons, armor, allies. Honestly, I think allies are one of the most useful things in the game because allies, like Dave mentioned, you can only attack one of those three phases during each of the attack rounds. But if you have an ally, that ally can take one of those slots and actually allow you to attack one other time. If you have two allies, you can attack each round instead of having to defend. So you can be doing damage every round of combat if you have enough allies to do so. Not only that, but if you take wounds, you can assign them to the allies. Actually, if it's the ally attacking, the ally would be the one taking right. the wounds, right? If they failed, for example. So it does help you stay alive a little right. longer as yeah. well. Overall, I think it's a great game, especially for as old as this game is. Playing it, what was it, a month ago? It doesn't seem like a game from 2005. No, it doesn't. I was actually surprised when you said the date that it was that old. One of the things I love about this game, my wallet didn't love so much, is that there were so many expansions. Unreal number of expansions for this. Character selection, just the number of heroes that you can choose from. The stack of market cards with all the expansions. The stack is like never 8 inches tall. I mean, yeah, yeah, you'll never see them all. I love that aspect. It makes it so that the each game is a little bit different. And you can play tons of different characters. And hide that shield. <laughs> and hide that shield from me. The shield was awesome. <laughs> And 3rd Edition's out. It doesn't have as many expansions, and I own 3rd Edition. That is our episode. Four different games, four different dice games that you should check out. The one you probably already have. <laughs> Dust yeah. it off. Give Monopoly a try. Play him by the rules. Let the anger just embrace it. Embrace the anger. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, we'll see you at the game table. Something, something dark side. As always, we want to thank you for listening. Check out our website. We have all sorts of cool things there. Love those blogs. Get a deeper look into the writing side of Maple Nation. Join our Facebook group, Maple Nation Off Air. I look forward to seeing you there. Follow us on Twitter, at Maple Nation. We also have Instagram. Under the same name. We also want to thank our sponsor, GameTalkersLLC.com. We love their product, and they have so much goodness out there. And we also want to thank Brain Detergent for our music. Meeple Nation Podcast, episode 382. Roll them four buckets. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was going to be so easy because he didn't have the sponsorship. <laughs> roll, roll them four games. Which Medici came back, came out. Medici came back, er, came back. Then you'll combine that bonus toil, that bonus toil. Then you'll combine. Then you'll combine that bonus top. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, we'll see. That's one this of those episode. nights. That's one of those nights. We'll see you at the game table. Something, something dark side. Embrace it. <laughs> <laughs>